Good evening. My name is Greg Beidel, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Genetic Medicine here at Northwestern University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's installment of the Silverstein Lecture Series. Uh, the Silverstein Lecture Series is made possible by a very generous donation from uh, Herman and B. Silverstein, whose goal with this series was to bring advances in genetics and medicine to the general public and help people understand uh, where the advances in medicine and genetics are can fit into their lives. And I think tonight we have a really important uh, topic to talk about, and that is a topic that will, uh, in many ways, could revolutionize how we think about cancer. Uh, the potential of this idea is still being explored. And tonight we have one of the world's experts in the area to guide us through thinking about how these this uh, new idea is going to play out. And our speaker tonight is Dr. Uh, Max Wichaw, and he is a very, very distinguished speaker. He is the uh, Distinguished Prof Professor of Oncology at the University of Michigan, and he is also uh, currently, and has been since 1986, the Director of the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center. And his CV is impressive, uh, both in its quantity and quality, and in fact, I had to put extra paper in my printer <laughs> to print it out. Uh, Dr. Wichaw, got his undergraduate degree at Stony Brook in New York, and then his medical degree at Stanford University. And then for his most of his medical uh, residency and training, he was here at the University of Chicago. So we can, to some extent, claim him as a native. Uh, and from there, he went to the NIH. And he has developed a research program that has profoundly influenced the cancer uh, field. And to give you an idea of, of his impact, uh, you can look at his the number of scientific advisory boards, site visit committees, and study sections that he's been on. The list runs for two pages, including being uh, director of the um, uh, external advisory board for North Northwestern University's uh, Cancer Center. Okay, he's uh, been an editor of five journals, uh, at least five journals. He has 13 patents. He started one company. He has published over 150 papers uh, in peer-reviewed journals, which together have accumulated more than 22,000 citations, which is uh, a truly astonishing number uh, compared to what most researchers get cited as. So it is a tremendous honor to have Dr. Wichaw talk to us tonight about cancer stem cells. Thanks very much, uh, Greg, and it really is a pleasure for me to be here. Chicago really is my second home. Not only did I do my internship and residency here, but my two children uh, live here, and as well as my grandchildren, so I make a lot of trips uh, back and forth. Uh, what I want to talk to you tonight uh, is about a, a relatively new area of cancer research that we think has the potential to revolutionize how we not only think about what cancer is, but how we develop treatments for cancer. Now, I'm sure that uh, most of you, or probably all of you in this room, in some way or another, have been touched by cancer. It's a devastating disease, uh, and soon it will be the number one killer in this country as we actually do better and better against cardiovascular disease. And what I'm going to do is to tell you about why we're so excited about some of the new developments and new directions in cancer research. And then we'll have time, I'm sure, at the end if you have questions about this area or any other area of cancer uh, research. I've been uh, a cancer researcher, and I'm a practicing oncologist. I take care of women with breast cancer. And I can honestly say that there's never been such enthusiasm about uh, some of the new research directions now and the potentials to really do much better than we have in the past. What I'm going to talk about is this area of stem cells in cancer. I'll explain what cancer stem cells really are and why this is such an important new area of cancer research. Now, as I mentioned to you, I am an uh, oncologist takes care of women with breast cancer, so I want to put this in perspective by asking a, a very fundamental question. How well are we really doing, if you take an objective view, how well are we doing in treating not only breast cancer, but the major types of cancer that we see in this country? And really, there is good news, but news that's not as good. 
So let me tell you about the good news first. If you actually just look at mortality from breast cancer in the USA or in the United Kingdom, it actually went up every year until about 1990, and it's come down about 1% a year. So that a woman today in this country has about a 25% less chance of dying of breast cancer than she did only in 1990. Part of that is due, due to better screening and finding cancers at earlier stages. Essentially, all of the rest of the gain in actual mortality, that is in reducing mortality, has been from very early treatments of breast cancer, what we call adjuvant treatments. And I'll explain a little bit later why we've made advances in adjuvant treatments. The bad news, though, it was illustrated in uh, an interesting article that came out about five years ago, not in a scientific journal. This was actually in Fortune magazine. So those of you that have business interests, maybe you look at Fortune magazine. And it was uh, by a, um, uh, an associate editor of Fortune magazine, uh, Cliff Leaf, and he's actually written a book this year also. And the basic uh, contention of both of these is we're losing the war on cancer despite the billions of dollars that have been invested in cancer research. He quotes statistics that show that the mortality rates are going down because we catch cancers earlier and we treat them earlier. But once cancers are advanced, that is, they metastasize or spread, the life expectancy of patients has only increased modestly over the past 20 years. Now, when I first read this article, of course, I was upset by it. Uh, and I looked at, uh, at, the, uh, at the author, Cliff Leaf, and he had his biography on there. And the biography said that he himself actually had cancer, but it was Hodgkin's disease, a kind of lymph gland cancer, and he was actually cured of his cancer. And in his bi biography, he said that he actually was part of an experimental protocol at the National Cancer Institute that was developing new treatments for Hodgkin's disease. And when I looked at the years he was there, sure enough, that's when I went to the uh, National Cancer Institute to train. And to make a long story short, I contacted him, and I was the doctor who took care of him. So it, be, we, it turned into a friendship, and actually he visited us just a few uh, weeks ago, and he brought me, uh, which was amazing that he saved this, it was the hospital notes from when he was on this experimental protocol, and sure enough, at the bottom of the notes was my signature that I, that I uh, took care of him. So our discussion was, why haven't we done better? Despite the fact that our understanding of the molecular underpinnings or the genetic basis of cancer has advanced so tremendously over the last 30 years, why hasn't that yet been translated uh, uh, into great advances in, in cure rates for cancer? And what I'm going to show you tonight is that at least one of the reasons of this is that we haven't looked at cancer as a disease of development, that is, a disease that's related to stem cells. And as a result of that, many of our current treatments may be targeting the wrong populations within cancer. And I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by that, because that's quite a broad statement. Uh, so let me tell you what this hypothesis is that it now has been termed the cancer stem cell hypothesis. It's really a very old idea where over 100 years ago, it was postulated before we knew anything about stem cells, that there was a relationship between embryonic development, that is when you develop as an embryo, and what in cancer, and there was something that went wrong in cancer that resembled what happens during embryogenesis. However, it's really only in the last 15 years that we've had the technologies that have enabled us to really look at the detailed level at this cancer stem cell hypothesis. There are really two separate components in the cancer stem cell hypothesis. They're both important, but they actually have a, a very different kind of implications. So the first one concerns where do cancers come from in the first place? Very important question. Uh, and until recently, I think the answer that most uh, biologists would have been given is that cancer is just a disease of genetics or genes. And that if you have the right mutations in any cell in your body, it could become cancer. We think that's not, the, not true. And that was the, uh, the dogma. What we think now is that cancer probably arises in a limited set of cells in the body. And these cells have a unique characteristic. That characteristic is called self-renewal. Self-renewal is the ability of a cell to make exact copies of itself. And I'm going to explain why this is a stem cell property. And we think that probably all cancers arise either 
from normal stem cells that you have in your tissues or from other cells that acquire this characteristic of self-renewal. So that's actually very important, but even more important for the treatment of cancers is the idea that all cells in the cancer are not the same and that cancers are organized in a very complex way that resemble normal organs. And at the apex of a hierarchy of cells are these cancer stem cells, and they drive cancers. And the reason that we haven't done better at curing cancer is that these cancer stem cells are very resistant to the kinds of therapies that we usually use, like chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight and show you. Now, what are what is stem cells? Now, you hear a lot about stem cells in the news, so it's really important to understand what is a stem cell. A stem cell is a cell that primarily is characterized by this, again, unique characteristic. The only cells in your body that self-renew are stem cells or cells of the immune system. Now, you could say, what is self-renew? Don't all the cells in your body have the ability to duplicate and grow? They do, but there's a difference in the way that the most cells in your body duplicate themselves and the way stem cells do. Most cells, once they start dividing, the daughter cells have less capacity to divide and eventually they die out. So in other words, they have a finite lifespan. They're not immortal. Stem cells are very different. Stem cells, when they divide, the daughter cells are just like the parent cell, at least one of the daughter cells has the ability to go on indefinitely, whereas the other daughter cell does something very interesting. It does what we call differentiate, meaning that it can make the other cells in the organ. So the two unique characteristics of stem cells are self-renewal and the ability to differentiate into other cells. We know there are different types of stem cells. So the type of stem cell that you hear of the most are the embryonic stem cells. These are the cells in the embryo that essentially have unlimited capacity to not only self-renew, but to form any other uh, type of cell. And so these cells have potential for tissue repair. And that's why there's so much excitement in the uh, scientific community of using embryonic stem cells for things like tissue regeneration after strokes or Alzheimer's disease, or even after heart attacks. Uh, however, of course, there are political controversies in using these cells. And more recently, one uh, can take any cell in the body and essentially make it go back and behave like an embryonic stem cell. Now, there were also, though, and this is what some of you may not know, there are stem cells in all of your organs. Now, these are called adult stem cells, and the difference between an adult stem cell and an embryonic stem cell is that unlike an embryonic stem cell, an adult stem cell can self-renew, but it's limited in its potential into the types of cells that it will make to cells in that organ. So a breast stem cell, which I'm going to talk about today, can only make all of the cells in the breast. They can't, it can't make a colon or a lung. And a lung stem cell only makes lung cells. So they are limited to, to a tissue. What is very exciting now is what we're learning is that cancer also has stem cells. These stem cells, interestingly, appear to be positioned between the adult stem cell and the embryonic stem cell because they may arise from an adult stem cell, but they reactivate some of the genetic programs only found in the embryo, and that is what is at the heart of cancer. And that's what I'm going to talk about this evening. And what are the implications of it? This is a spoon's full of stem cells. Make the stem, you know, this was actually kind of a funny cartoon because in this experiment, they were trying to use skin stem cells to uh, actually uh, make a cosmetic effect in a woman. So what we're trying to do is hopefully uh, has much more uh, uh, public health significance, which is understanding stem cells and cancer. Now, the organ that I've been working on is the, is the breast. And of course, the breast is a, a very interesting system from a biologist's point of view, because the breast undergoes tremendous changes during pregnancy. The number of breast cells increase almost 100 times during a woman's pregnancy. And then the cells actually differentiate, and they make milk. But of course, the reason really I was interested in this from the beginning of my career was not only as a biologist, but as a cancer physician, because breast cancer is uh, the most common cancer in women and the second most uh, important in terms of uh, the, not, the death rate. And so in order to understand and develop new treatments for breast cancer, we've always believed that one had to really understand what makes the breast 
uh, cancer cells actually grow and behave the way they do. So let me illustrate what a stem cell is, what a stem cell would, would be like in the breast. Uh, and when we started this research about 15 years ago in stem cells, there really was no uh, I, a way to identify stem cells in any organ, with the exception of the blood system. The, the blood system uh, had had very elegant experiments done in which it was shown that you could find blood stem cells that could give rise to all of the other cells in the blood. But there wasn't anything like that in the breast. So a stem cell in the breast has those two properties that I already talked about. It can make exact copies of itself, that, and that maintains the stem cells, and grows during pregnancy. But then during lactation, when a woman then uh, breastfeeds a baby, the breast cells make milk. And so that's kind of the business end uh, of what happens. Now what we've learned is during cancer, what happens is these self-renewal process become abnormal, and they do so through mutations in the stem cell. And that leads to a breast tumor. And the key, what I'm going to show you, is that the breast tumor cells are not all the same. At the top of the hierarchy of the breast tumors are these breast stem cells. And different kinds of breast cancer look like they come from different cells in the breast, and they're driven by different stem cells. So when we started this, we didn't know what a breast stem cell would look like at all. So how would we go about finding uh, this cell? So we actually started our research, not in breast cancer, but with normal breast tissue. Women that have cosmetic surgery, that want to have smaller breasts, agreed to let us use some of that tissue to try to isolate stem cells from the human breast. And what we were able to do was to use protein markers, and I'll explain what this, how this works and why this is related to cancer. But what we were able to do was to isolate cells from the normal human breast that we could then used to study breast stem cells. And what we found is that we developed conditions that we could actually grow them in little petri dishes in the laboratory. And a breast stem cell could, could form these little uh, uh, balls within the laboratory, and they fill up with milk when you put in human milk hormones. But even more significantly, we found a particular cell that when we grew it in the laboratory could give rise to what looked like a little human breast from a single cell in the laboratory. And this was the breast stem cell. The fundamental question then was, this was a normal breast stem cell. What do we actually see in cancer? Well, this just actually shows that we developed a method for actually growing human breasts in a mouse. What we found is we, we had to take the stem cell and mix it with the cells around it, because it has to be in the right environment. And essentially, we, we grew human breasts in a mouse, and that actually led to some of these studies. Now let's describe how does cancer actually develop? Well, research over the last 30 years in many laboratories has suggested that cancer doesn't arise in a single step, at least the most common cancers like breast cancer, but probably takes many years to develop. And what happens is one gets mutations, and these mutations then build up over time. Now, we can time some of this from looking at some unfortunate uh, uh, results that happened uh, in events like the uh, atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, unfortunately, in, from this terrible event, women were exposed to radiation. And what was found was that uh, young girls who were in their late adolescence, if they were exposed to radiation, about 25 to 30 years later, there was a tremendous uh, incidence of breast cancer developed. So that actually set the time scale that some of the early events probably to go from a normal cell to a fully uh, a, a metastatic or a fully developed cancer could take 25 or 30 years. The only cells that live that long in the body are stem cells. They're the only cells that, if they mutate, can pass these on to their daughter cells. Uh, if you get a mutation in another cell that's not a stem cell, it won't be around 20 years or 25 years later. So that led to the hypothesis that maybe mutations occurred in these stem cells, and they built up over time. So these are two competing models of how cancer actually develops. It looks like a, bi a billiard balls here, but let me explain why these are actually important and why our current thinking is that cancer is somewhere in the middle of all of this. The uh, thinking of cancer development from just from mutations is what we call a stochastic model. Stochastic means a random model. But basically what this model said is that cancer just happens at random because any cell 
forms a mutation, and that mutation gives a kind of selective advantage to the cell, so it forms like a clone of cells. And then that clone of cells gets a secondary mutation. And in, that, in this case, uh, cancer development is thought of as a selection, kind of like Darwin's selection in evolution, survival of the fittest. One just gets a fit cell and it becomes a cancer. But in this model, any cell is equally able to form a cancer. The cancer stem cell model is a fundamentally different way of looking at cancer. If mutations only in the stem cell are important and mutations in other cells are rapidly thrown off, then what one gets is when cancer develops, one th has to think of a cancer as an abnormal organ. And just like normal organs are organized in a hierarchy with stem cells at the apex, we then postulated that there would be cancer stem cells that would be the only cell that could give rise to other cancer cells, and that uh, these would be the most important cells in a cancer. So how do you distinguish these two? Well, luckily, there was some pioneering work done in the blood system by John Dick and his colleagues in Toronto. And they had already described that in human leukemias, only a very small percentage of the human leukemias could transfer the leukemia if you put it into a mouse. So we then did the first experiment that really showed that human solid tumors also have stem cells and are hierarchically organized. What we did, and this was along with my colleagues Michael Clark and, um, and Sean Morrison uh, in the 2002, what we did was to just do a very simple experiment, but it turned out to have very important implications. We took human breast cancers and we reasoned that if there were really stem cells, if we took protein markers that were found on the normal stem cell and isolated breast cancer cells that had this marker, they should be able to form cancers if we injected them into a mouse. But if we took other cells from a cancer, even if they look the same, they should not be able to do it. And indeed, that's what we found. So these are actually two markers. I, I won't go through all of the technical details of what they were, but as little as 200 cells from a woman's tumor made a, a breast cancer grow when we put it into a mouse, whereas 100 times more, 20,000 cells from the mouse made no, no cancer at all if they didn't have the right markers that were stem cell markers. Now, interestingly, when we looked at these cells, what we found is the cancer stem cells, actually the pathologist said these don't even look like cancer. These were the ones that looked much more bizarre, but these were just dead-end cells. And to our surprise, what we found that these only constituted 1 to 5% of the cells in the cancer. These were uh, 95 to 99% of the cells in the cancer. The problem is that the vast majority of cancer research and cancer therapy have been directed at killing these cells when these are the seeds of the cancer, uh, and that really led to the whole field of cancer stem cells and targeting cancer stem cells in the clinic. What we found then is as cancers develop, these stem cells multiply, and we could actually even find, this is in red here, these are our markers of the cancer stem cells. This is the earliest stage of breast cancer called ductal carcinoma in situ. The difference between this and a fully uh, can, uh, developed cancer is that the cancer can invade or metastasize. We can actually cure most breast cancers if they're limited to the breast because we can remove them with surgery or treat them with radiation. The deadly form of breast uh, cancer in all cancers is metastasis, and you can see these stem cells are starting to actually invade and metastasize here. Now, if our model was right, not only should these stem cells be the cells that can make the cancer grow, but they should be the deadly seeds of metastasis. Because again, the important concept is it's really the spread of a cancer to distant organs or metastasis that is the deadly part of the cancer. So in order to do this, we did the following experiment. We took breast cancers and we labeled them with a gene that allows the cancer cells to glow in the dark. It's called luciferase. What it essentially does is it enables us to put the cancers in a mouse and then the cancers actually glow if they spread to a different organ. And if we put the mouse in a light box that's very dark, we have a very sensitive camera that can actually detect the light even through the body of a mouse so we could see where the, where the cells metastasize. But what we did is we took the breast cancer cells and separated out the stem cells using these markers on the surface and then injected them into the mouse. So this mouse, you see that's sleeping here? They have little nose cones here. But these mice here then are put in the camera, and this mouse got the stem cells. And you can see that the stem cells metastasized to the bones of the mouse. 
from the same breast cancer, the cells that didn't have the stem cell uh, marker form no metastasis. This particular kind of breast cell, uh, cell here spread not only to here and bone, but spread to the lung and the liver, unfortunately, just like in our, in our patients, but only the, the uh, breast cells that had the stem cell marker, not the non-stem cells. So again, that's telling us that these cells are really important because they not only promote the growth of the cancer, they, they promote its metastasis. Well, why is this important? If you take women who have early stage breast cancer, stage one breast cancer that we think is limited to the breast, and do a biopsy of their bone, and look for cells in the bone, even though they, we don't think they have metastasis, what we find is that about a third of the women already have cells that are sitting in the bone marrow. Now you could say, why would anyone ever do this? Well, about 10 years ago, we used to think that bone marrow transplant was a, a way to treat women with advanced breast cancers. It turned out it was wrong, it didn't work at all. But as part of that, we would take biopsies of women who had breast cancer, and we looked for them to see if they had cancer cells, and we found that a third of them actually did have cancer in there. Now, what's very interesting is that if you look at women who have these single cells sitting in the bone marrow and follow them for 15 years, half of them will go on to develop big metastases, and this could be fatal if the metastases grow. The other uh, half have these sitting there, but they, they don't grow, at least at 15 years. So what is actually going on? What we think now is that these stem cells exist in two different states that we've discovered, and we've just reported on this year of how this works. One form of the stem cell makes it invade and form a metastasis, but it sits there as a dormant metastasis, and it has to flip back into another state, a proliferating state, in order to actually of a form of metastasis. So if you have a, a single cell that doesn't have a stem cell, it won't grow. If you have a cell uh, that has a stem cell, it can form a metastasis, it can be fatal. But there are some women where you can have a dormant metastasis. And what we're studying now is what makes the dormant metastasis grow all of a sudden. Now, as an oncologist, we all had these stories from patients in our clinic but we thought they were just kind of anecdotes. I had some women that would go 15 years, and we were, of course, really hoping that the woman was cured of a breast cancer, particularly in one form of breast cancer that is fueled by estrogen. But many women had stories where within a year or two before the breast cancer came back, they had a very traumatic event, like they lost their spouse or they were in an automobile accident. What we think now is that tr stress causes release of certain uh, molecules that we call cytokines, and what we've discovered is that these cytokines are the key regulators of the dormancy of the stem cell. And it may be what takes a dormant stem cell and makes it go back into cycle. This is one of the cytokines, it's called interleukin-6, and it actually uh, causes the dormant stem cell to go back into cycle. Well, what about therapy? When you think of it, how have we developed therapies? Well, one thing that we always do when we treat patients, and of course I do the same thing in my clinic, is if we give a patient chemotherapy, we want to see if the chemotherapy is working, we do scans. We do CAT scans, we do MRI scans, and we measure the tumor. And we say, is the tumor getting bigger or is the tumor getting smaller? And of course we want it to get smaller and shrink down. The problem is that therapies have been approved based on what we call tumor regression. If the tumor can shrink down by 50%, we say that the cancer therapy is effective or active, and new drugs have been approved based on that. When you think of it, what we've done is, since 95 to 99% of the cancer is the bulk tumor cells, not the stem cell, we've developed many therapies that are very effective at killing the bulk cells, but they leave the stem cell behind. What that does then is, uh, cause a tumor regression, but the tumor grows back because the stem cell is still there. So for breast cancer and for many other cancers, there is a very poor correlation between tumor regression and patient survival. We've developed many therapies that can shrink the cancer down, but it comes right back. We give one therapy after the next and the cancer keeps coming back because the stem cells are highly resistant to treatment. And so we think that if the stem cell model is right, we've used the wrong endpoint. We, both in our uh, models of developing new cancer drugs as well as in our clinical trials because we use tumor uh, shrinkage as the endpoint. 
Uh, also, uh, I'll talk about how we're then proceeding then to actually try to attack the cancer stem cell. Well, you could say this is an interesting idea. Is there any evidence that this really occurs? So I'm going to tell you two stories here on this slide uh, that relate to this. Uh, and th th this is a, a, a study that was uh, reported by our clinical collaborator uh, who's in Texas, Jenny Chang. So what this is is a, a type of treatment that a clinical trial where we take women with breast cancer and we use a kind of treatment called neoadjuvant therapy. Neoadjuvant therapy means that we actually give the treatment while the cancer is still there and we can actually see if the treatment is affecting the cancer. The usual way we would treat cancer is to remove it first with surgery or uh, a lumpectomy and radiation. So you remove all the cancer and then you give therapy. That's adjuvant therapy. But neoadjuvant therapy, you actually have the cancer in place and you give the treatment first. So in the upper two slides, what Jenny Chang did was to treat patients with chemotherapy. And when she treated them with chemotherapy, the tumors shrank down, as we hope that they do. But what she did then is use the assays that we had developed to measure the stem cells. And what you could see is this is the percent of stem cells using the markers that we, uh, and assays we developed. As the tumor shrank down, the percent of stem cells actually went up. Now, interestingly, there is one form of breast cancer that actually has been the uh, biggest uh, advance in our treatment over the last uh, decade. And this is part of what has resulted in the decrease in mortality. There is, we know now there are different forms of breast cancer, and there's one form of breast cancer that is called HER2-positive breast cancer. HER2 is a receptor for a growth factor on the surface of some cells, and about 20% of breast cancers have too many copies of the gene of HER2, so it essentially drives the cancers to grow very fast. And so it's an aggressive form of breast cancer. The good news is there are new therapies like Herceptin that was specifically designed to target HER2. And what uh, Jenny Chang did was there were some breast cancers that were HER2 positive, and in addition to chemotherapy, they got a HER2 targeting agent. And what happened is that these women started with a higher percentage of, of stem cells than the women who didn't have HER2 positive cancers. But as you treated them with the HER2 blocker and the cancer shrank down, the stem cells didn't go up. So that suggested to us also early that there was something very interesting going on here. And what I'm going to show you later is that HER2 has turned out to be such an important uh, uh, marker and drug that we target in breast cancer that is HER2 positive because HER2 is a regulator of cancer stem cells. Uh, so that turned out to be actually really very interesting. But also, uh, I should mention that there are some women where you treat them and the cancer goes away completely. We call that a complete pathologic response, meaning there's no cancer left at all. It turns out that that is associated with a much better outcome. If you treat the, women, the woman and there's no cells left, there's a much better outcome. But interestingly, if you get 99% shrinkage of the tumor but there's cells left behind, Recent articles have shown that if stem cells are left behind, the woman doesn't do any better than if there's no shrinkage of the tumor. But if there's 100% shrinkage of the tumor, it means you got rid of all the stem cells too. Interestingly, about 20% of women with, treated with chemotherapy have a complete pathologic response, but 60% of women who have HER2 amplified breast cancer that get treated with HER2 targeted therapies have a complete pathologic response. Uh, and we think the reason, again, for that is if you have a 99% shrinkage, but you still have 1% stem cells left, you still haven't gotten rid of the seeds of the cancer. What was uh, uh, though uh, uh, even more interesting to us is when we started to do the same kind of things in our mice with cancer, we found something that was even more frightening. We found that when we looked at the number of stem cells, and not just the percent of stem cells, when we gave chemotherapy, the stem cells actually were increasing. It wasn't just that they were resistant to treatment. It seemed like for some reason the chemotherapy was even stimulating this cancer stem cells. So it was very frightening. And when we first reported that, we got a lot of negative feedback from our oncology colleagues because they said, what are we scaring our patients, that they shouldn't take chemotherapy? But what we found was how that actually works. I already told you that some of these inflammatory mediators called cytokines, when you're under a lot of stress, go up in your body. And so we reasoned, is it possible that when we treat with chemotherapy, we are actually causing a stress in the local environment? When you think of it, when your organs are damaged, 
the damaged cells have to send out a distress signal to the stem cells in the organ to go and re reproduce themselves and to repair the tissue. Is it possible that in a tumor, when we were treating it with chemotherapy, the dying cancer cells were doing the same thing? And indeed, that's exactly what we found. So what happens is when we treat with chemotherapy, these cells uh, are actually self-destroying, but at the same time, they make one of these interleukins, in this case called interleukin-8, and we, this, we work out the pathway of what this actually does. It actually stimulates the, uh, the stem cell. It turns out that actually this is not only a damage response, but during pregnancy, a woman actually makes interleukin-8 during pregnancy because it, re it, it, it stimulates the stem cells to reproduce during pregnancy. So that's the bad news. The good news is since we figured out that there is a specific receptor that binds this interleukin-8, could we then block this process? And it turned out that a small molecule drug was developed by an Italian company called Dompe, but not as an anti-cancer agent. It was designed to block rejection in transplants because it's an anti-inflammatory, anti-cytokine agent. So we got some of this from them, and what we discovered was that if we gave this along with chemotherapy, this is what happens to the stem cells if you just give chemotherapy, they go up. But if you block this inflammatory receptor, you can completely block that. So what this is telling us is, can we now take the new knowledge that we have and try to improve the, the, the uh, uh, efficiency of cancer treatments by taking our existing treatment but giving this blocker? Uh, oh, whoops, I thought I was going to show this. I'm afraid I didn't put the slide in. We actually have instituted a clinical trial now that's based on this. Uh, and we now have treated about 33 patients uh, in several different centers. And what we find is that this agent uh, has really no uh, added side effects. And we have a number of women that, of the 33 that have now been on this trial now for over a year and a half without any progression of their cancer. And we'll be starting then this year to actually do what we call a randomized trial, which will compare chemotherapy alone to chemotherapy plus this uh, stem cell blocker. Now, the next ex example I want to show you about how we're moving this into the clinic in involves another area that was, was uh, for the last 10 years, was thought it was going to be a big breakthrough in cancer research. This was based on the idea first pioneered by Judah Folkman, and it's called angiogenesis research. So what was known and what uh, uh, Judah Folkman pioneered was the idea that when cancers grow, they can only grow to a small size unless they can stimulate the body to make blood vessels that would then feed the cancer. The feeding of a cancer uh, is called angiogenesis, and a variety of uh, mediators of the tumor called angiogenesis factors were developed. And so it was very exciting that a number of companies actually made drugs called angiogenesis inhibitors to try to block the blood supply to tumors, and hopefully then patients would do, would, would do better. And there were a number of these that have actually been approved. The one that was used the most was called bevacizumab or Avastin, and then there are some other ones over here. And there was a lot of excitement uh, because in the early clinical trials, when um, bevacizumab was given along with chemotherapy, the time to progression of the tumor was greatly delayed. And so the FDA approved uh, the bevacizumab, and it was being used very frequently in this country, not only for breast cancer, but for many other cancers. The problem was that when the women were followed for a longer period of time, the results and the uh, excitement, uh, I think, uh, dissipated because what we found was that although the time to tumor progression was delayed, once the tumors started growing back, they actually grew back faster. And so the women weren't actually living longer compared to if they didn't get this and they just got chemotherapy alone. So this suggested to us again that perhaps cancer stem cells were being involved here. Well, why is that? Well, it turns out that oxygen, or the, what we all breathe and what all your cells depend on, is an important regulator of normal stem cells. But contrary to what you might think uh, intuitively, stem cells like low oxygen, not high oxygen. And it's probably because they are in environments that cause them to be protected then and not to develop a lot of mutations. So within your bone marrow or within your intestine, the stem cells are in an environment that we call a niche that has low oxygen tensions. Uh, and so we, we reasoned that, is it possible 
that by cutting the blood supply off to a tumor with an anti-angiogenic agent, you were just depriving the tumor of oxygen. And the stem cells would love this condition, which we call hypoxia or low oxygen. And you might just be stimulating the stem cell the way the chemotherapy was. And indeed, that's what we found. So Sarah Conley, who was a, uh, uh, a uh, postdoc in the lab, now has her own lab, did the following experiment. She grew breast tumors, and you can see they grow here. If you give this an anti-angiogenic agent, they stop growing, just like they do in patients. And here you can see what the tumor looks like when it grows. If you give the anti-angiogenic agent, notice these are white because they don't have a blood supply. The problem was when you then measured the stem cells with our stem cell assay, when you give the anti-angiogenic agent, you actually stimulate the stem cells. Well, how do we know these are really stem cells? Well, not only do they express markers, but there's an assay that we use to tell whether something is really a stem cell. Because by definition, if it's a stem cell, it has to be able to initiate tumors if you put it in another mouse. So what we did is we took different amounts of cells that were either from mice that just uh, uh, got, uh, here got chemotherapy alone, or uh, uh, got chemotherapy plus the anti-angiogenic agent, and we put them in secondary mice. And notice how many uh, tumors grew, or the amount of tumor growth from the animals that didn't get the anti-angiogenic agent. We got 10 times more of them if we gave the anti-angiogenic agent. This actually shows graphically what happens in the tumors. We stain these tumors with a, a chemical that turns green in areas of low oxygen or hypoxia. We also stain the tumors with a stem cell marker that, that shows red. This is a tumor here that just is growing without any treatments. This tumor then gets the anti-angiogenic agent. Notice this big hypoxic area shown in green. And if you look at red here, all of the stem cells are all right around it. So what we've done is we've created all these niches that the stem cells love and they, uh, and they actually, um, again, I didn't put my clinical trials in here. So what we're actually doing with this is we're working to combine stem cell targeting drug with an anti-angiogenic agent. Uh, and I'll, I'll say at the end of my talk, I'll show you some of the clinical trials that we're trying to do now. Because when we discover these things, it leads to new ideas of how can we try to develop new treatments to try to target the cancer stem cell uh, to prevent these kind of uh, stimulation of the cancer stem cells. Now, I mentioned a little bit about HER2 and breast cancer. But I want to just use this to show you that by not considering cancer stem cells, even though the development of HER2 targeting agents has been a great advance in breast cancer, by not considering stem cells, we think that we've gone down again some of the wrong road, uh, and we probably are underutilizing some of the drugs that target uh, HER2, and I'll show you what I mean by this. So I already told you that HER2 is, is overexpressed or amplified in about 20% of breast cancers, and we actually showed that this actually drives the uh, cancer stem cell. This is just, if you take a cell and you overexpress this HER2 gene, you get more stem cells. This is a different cell, you get more stem cells. Also, if you take a HER2 amplified tumor and treat it with Herceptin, you knock down the stem cells. So all of this seemed to make a lot of sense until we looked uh, at a very interesting result that was reported in the clinical literature that had no explanation. Uh, and let me explain kind of, of what, what has been the huge advance in using Herceptin and why do we see such a decrease in the death rates when I told you metastatic cancers are so hard to, uh, to treat. Well, the huge advance in HER2 positive breast cancer has not been in treating women who have far advanced breast cancers, but it's been in using breast cancer in what we call the adjuvant setting. That is, after we remove the primary tumor, but with there, when there are no apparent metastases, we give a drug, and that's called an adjuvant treatment. And when, uh, the way we've developed adjuvant treatments is we take what works in advanced disease and we just give it earlier, assuming that it's going to work in, uh, even better if you give it in the early setting. So in the early studies with Herceptin, Herceptin was only given to women who have HER2-positive breast cancer. And then this article was published in our leading clinical journal, New England Journal of Medicine, that kind of set the breast cancer uh, 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 clinical researchers on edge because it didn't seem to make any sense. What was done in this study is one of the very large studies that had d demonstrated that if you took a, a woman who had HER2 positive breast cancer and gave her Herceptin once every three weeks for a year, the chance of the breast cancer coming back was reduced by over 50 percent. 
and the follow-up was over four, uh, five years. So HER2 positive breast cancer is a very aggressive form of breast cancer. So virtually all in this type of breast cancer, the women don't recur. If they go 10 years, they're cured. So more than half the women were cured by getting this year of Herceptin. But they were trying to look at the assays for HER2 and see how, how accurate the assays were. So they got all of the samples from the patients and they retested them again in a central laboratory. And what they found was very uh, surprising. So these are the HER2 positive patients, and this is the relative risk, meaning 0.66, meaning that here, that uh, there's a, 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 here, HER2 positive 0.47, means that there's greater than a 50% reduction in the cancer recurrence in women who were HER2 positive. The surprising thing was that there were about 170 women that were called HER2 positive by the laboratory, but when they reanalyzed it, it was a mistake. They were really not HER2 positive, they were HER2 negative. But when they looked at the results, they benefited even more from Herceptin. Now, this was being touted as one of the biggest examples of the benefits of the new frontier targeted therapy, where you target a specific gene with a specific drug. And indeed, it did work very well, but apparently it worked even better where you didn't have the target expressed. So it created a, a lot of confusion. How could this really be the case? To us, it suggested, though, that perhaps the reason that this uh, result didn't make sense is that one we're considering, when you consider tumors, the, the cancer stem cell model suggests that not all the cells in the cancer are the same, and is it possible that you may have a tumor where only some of the cells in the cancer express HER2, but not others? To make a long story short, that's exactly what we found. 20% of women have HER2 amplified breast cancer, but 65% of women have breast cancers that express estrogen receptor but don't have amplification of the HER2 gene. And what we found was that in those cancers, even without uh, amplification of the HER2 gene, if we look at the cancer, it actually is expressing HER2, but it's only in 1% to 5% of the cells. It's only in the stem cells. So this shows a particular kind of cell that's always used as kind of a negative control here because it doesn't have amplification of the HER2 gene. And these are the non-stem cells. These are the stem cells. And you can see they actually do express HER2 over here. So I'm going to actually skip some of this. But what it, what it actually means is how can uh, Herceptin really work then in women that are HER2 negative? What we found was, remember I told you that a third of women actually have uh, micrometastasis in their bone marrow, even though we think that the cancer was limited. They actually have micrometastasis. What we actually found was that the HER2 in the bone marrow is actually regulated by the microenvironment in the bone marrow. So these are the level of HER2 in women that are HER2 negative. When we did bone marrow biopsies on the women from the same woman, the uh, HER2 in the bone marrow was actually being expressed, but there, none of these were due to amplification of the gene. So what this is telling us is we've kind of gone down the wrong track of developing adjuvant therapies because we've assumed that just because something shrinks down a cancer in the, in the advanced setting, it will be the best thing to use in the adjuvant setting. And what we've now discovered is that uh, therapies that really work in the adjuvant setting do so because they are killing micrometastases before they can even develop. So rather than using things that deplete cancers, what we really need are, are to use things that attack stem cells. And our belief is that if we can attack stem cells, particularly in the adjuvant setting, we'll cure many more cancers. So the best way to think of it, it's been now called like the, the, the dandelion model of cancer stem cells, is that current therapies largely kill the uh, leaves of, the, of a weed, but it leaves the roots behind. And what we need are root killers that kill the cancer stem cell. So this is a circuit diagram that is a result of research not only in our lab, but many others that are looking at the genetic pathways that regulate the cancer stem cell. And based on this, a number of companies, including one that I founded along with Michael Clark, are developing new drugs to move into the clinic. So I'm, I'm going to skip this. This actually shows just how the drugs actually can, can knock down cancer stem cells in our preclinical models. And these are nine clinical trials that we now have going on at our cancer center that are actually designed to target cancer stem cells. Now, as you can imagine, we have to do this very cautiously because we actually were quite concerned that when we put in 
drugs that can actually target cancer stem cells, is it possible that they will have a lot of side effects because some of the pathways that regulate the cancer stem cells also regulate normal stem cells. You need normal stem cells to live. You have to have them in your blood to make blood, uh, bone marrow make blood cells. You have to have them in your gut. So we've done these very cautiously. But what we found is that so it, there are surprisingly low side effects from these in our trials, particularly if we give them at the right doses and the right schedules. One of the challenges is how are we going to even know if this is working? Now, of course, we'd like to see patients live longer. So ultimately, that will be the uh, real test of whether these inhibitors of these pathways that regulate the stem cells make patients live longer. But we can't use the endpoints that we're so used to using in the clinic as oncologists. We can't use shrinkage of cancers because stem cells uh, and shrinkage of cancers are not the same model. So we have to develop new ways of monitoring patients to see if we can hit cancer stem cells. This just shows in our cancer center we now have groups that are looking at stem cells in all these different kinds of cancers. And what we're finding is that many of the pathways that regulate the cancer stem cells in breast cancer also regulate the cancer stem cells in other cancers. We think virtually all cancers have cancer stem cells. Some of them are more frequent and some of them are less frequent. And so some of the drugs that we're going to select are not based on what kind of cancer it is, but what is the stem cell and what are the pathways that regulate it. So there's a lot of excitement now in cancer research of being able to profile cancers and do molecular profiling. As a matter of fact, our cancer center is one of the worldwide leaders in doing a molecular profile. You know, I think a good way to look at this is when the genome was first sequenced, and look at all the letters in the alphabet in the year 2000 was first sequenced, it took about 10 years and it cost $3 billion to do the first genome. We can now sequence a patient's tumor within three weeks for about $3,000. And we're now doing it on all, we've done about 300 or 350 patient genomes. But what we're finding is that's only one little piece of the, not little, but it's one piece of the story. And the way we put together now a family tree or an evolution is that what we have within a tumor are stem cells. And the stem cells themselves can mutate. So you can have different clones of stem cells, and those different clones then can produce different clones of daughter cells. So what we have to do is develop new ways of being able to tell what are the pathways that drive the different clones within a patient's cancer, and how are we going to do that? It sounds like an impossible task. In order to do that, we're, pa pa we're partnering very closely with our engineering colleagues to develop new ways to isolate cancer stem cells from the blood of patients. Rather than putting biopsy needles in patients, which one is very inefficient and probably not very accurate, we're developing new method, methods using microfluidic devices to isolate single cells from patients' tumors. And from a single cell now, we can now do a complete uh, genomic analysis, uh, and we hope that we'll be able to treat patients then by monitoring their cancer stem cells. Now, I'm going to just finish by uh, 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 saying that since cancer developed over many years, cancer stem cell concepts are important not only for the therapy of cancer, but even for the prevention of cancer, because we think that the earliest events in cancer are expansion of clones of mutated stem cells. And if we had ways of inhibiting these mutated clones before they became fully developed cancers, we could prevent many cancers. Uh, and one of the ways to do that, it turns out, is exercise. exercise uh, downregulate some of these uh, cytokines that regulate the stem cell. We think that's why exercise is an effective prevention, can reduce the incidence of cancers. We've also found that some of the dietary components that have shown to be having cancer prevention properties actually inhibit some of the same pathways that regulate the cancer stem cell. This one got a fair amount of publicity. This was from uh, uh, broccoli sprouts, sulforaphane, inhibits one of the cancer stem cell pathways. Another one is called turmeric. And this just emphasizes that a lot of our research now, this is a picture of our cancer center, involves what we call translational research, which means close collaboration between research laboratories and clinics to work together uh, in doing this. And this is just um, a, a picture of my lab group, the uh, people that work on this. And it's very important that we all work together in these, uh, in these uh, ways uh, now, particularly in this exciting time where we're moving both the treatment of cancer and cancer prevention, trying to develop new agents to target uh, cancer stem cells. So uh, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'd be glad to answer any questions about this.
I'd like to thank a number of people who were very critical in uh, making this presentation possible. First, the Silversteins, who uh, provided the funding for this. Uh, second, uh, the uh, interim director of the Center for Genetic Medicine, uh, Peter Kopp. And uh, Michelle Mone uh, and the staff of the Center for Genetic Medicine have been terrific in helping to organize this. Uh, so we'll move to questions. And uh, are there any questions out there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I was wondering, can you tell us a little bit about what the chromosomes uh, look like in the cancer stem cells? Yeah, so interestingly, the uh, genetics or the mutations in the cancer stem cell are the same as in other cells. So what that tells us is there's two levels of regulation, because when you think of it, the cancer stem cell actually gives rise to daughter cells. So it has the same chromosomal abnormalities as the daughter cells, but it turns off a variety of, and turns on a variety of other genes. So it's not enough to know what the mutations are and what the chromosomes are. You have to know, in addition, what are the genes that are actually being ex expressed in the cell. So there's some, do you think there's some kind of protective action within that cell? Well, there is actually some very interesting research, though, that relates to this. And it, it, it actually was a big surprise, although it's been proposed a, a while ago. We think when it's a cell divides that its DNA goes equally into the two daughter cells. But there's some evidence now that in stem cells, they use a unique way of segregating their DNA. So the new strand of DNA that's being made goes to the daughter cell. And so new mutations accumulate much more rapidly in the daughter cells, and the stem cell keeps the parent cell, which has less errors in it. And that may be an evolutionary way to at least limit the amount of mutations that one has so that you don't get cancers all the time. Thank you. Yes, over here. Uh, could you reprise just quickly what you said about the, uh, the HER2 negative cells, stem cells becoming uh, cancerous? I didn't quite grasp that. Yeah, so the, the idea of HER2 is, we think HER2 is actually even much more important than we thought it was, probably also going to be in other cancers, not just in breast cancer, because, because of the dramatic effects of HER2 blockade, uh, HER2 targeting drugs in HER2 positive breast cancer. Everyone in the cancer community, I think, assumed that the only cancers, both breast cancer and other cancers, where HER2 was going to be really important was with, when there was too many copies of the gene. But our research suggests that in other tumors where you don't have too many copies of the gene, HER2 is still important, but you don't see it because it's only expressed in the, in the stem cells and it regulates the stem cells. So when you look at the total tumor, you don't see the gene amplification. You have to look just at the stem cells. So based on this, we now have a group that's looking at potentially is HER2 important in stomach cancer, in ovarian cancer, in lung cancer. It may have been missed in these other cancers because it's not amplified in those cancers. And that means that maybe some of these drugs that we even have available to us today may actually be much more effective in other kinds of cancers than we would have guessed before. Um, I have a quick question. Is it true that uh, cancer stem cells are mutated normal stem cells? Yeah, so, so this is the question, what's the relation between a mutated normal stem cell and a cancer stem cell? The two are very related, but it doesn't mean that all cancers come from mutated stem cells. Some cancers may come from a cell that is a, a daughter of the, of the stem cell, but the mutation itself has to allow it to self-renew. So it has to make it behave like a stem cell. So a beautiful paper just came out this week in a, a very uh, a good journal called Cancer Cell that looked at a leukemia. And they traced back, this was a beautiful experiment because for the first time, it didn't involve any animal models or anything like that. They took from the same patients frozen samples of the human leukemia, and they went back years, and they traced back where it came from. And they proved that the human leukemia started in a normal blood stem cell. And they traced every mutation of how the clone expanded. So it's really proof of the cancer stem cell model came from the mutated normal stem cell. And we think that this is going to be true in other cancers, too. It's just this was the first one. It's a lot of work to do that and trace it all back, the first one who actually did this so carefully. You mentioned trying to <clears throat> combine treatments that, um, uh, that target stem cells with treatments that inhibit angiogenesis. Um, in that case, what's the specific benefit of trying to target angiogenesis since um, inhibiting angiogenesis seems to um, be good for the growth of stem cells? 
Well, our, our goal in these treatments is to target both the cancer stem cell and the bulk populations. If you don't target the bulk populations, the problem is that many patients by the time they're diagnosed already have a very big bulk of cancer. And even a, a small number of divisions could even be fatal because uh, when you think of it, the cancer is already so large that if it gets twice as large, it may actually be fatal. So we have to also, we can't ignore the bulk of the tumor to give us stem cell therapies enough time to knock out the roots of the cancer. And the anti-angiogenic therapies and chemotherapy are good at killing the bulk cells. I actually agree with you that sometime in the future, our goal would be to eliminate chemotherapy completely because even though I'm an oncologist and I give it all the time, I don't like it at all, and my patients clearly don't like it at all, too, because of the tremendous side effects that it has. So eventually, we have to figure out better ways of killing the bulk cells, too. But the good news is the bulk cells are sensitive to many kinds of treatments that we use already. Uh, it's the stem cells that have been so hard and is, that are so resistant. Okay. Uh, let's thank Dr. Wichaw. And again, he'll be outside with the reception, and uh, it's been a terrific seminar.